Language, be it written, spoken, or danced, is one of the most essential forms of expression across any culture. It allows you to take what's in your mind, an image, a location, a curiosity, and paint a picture of it in the mind of someone else. It isn't all that long ago that unless you were seated beside someone on your couch, your ability to play video games together was limited or non-existent. Nowadays, we can join 100-person games with people across the entire globe, but I don't think I realized the scope of this connection until I first played a Souls game, where player-etched messages can appear anywhere and everywhere. These messages were frequently similar, an unfortunate limitation of the system used. But more and more frequently, developers will intentionally toy with the expectation that our thoughts will be adequately conveyed to each other. In Barotrauma, a game where you and a group of your friends operate a submarine on the alien moon Europa, typed conversation between your crewmates becomes less legible as you leave communication range. Or a parasite could take your vocal cords, denying you the ability to ask for help until it's too late. In Project Zomboid, your written text comes out as actual sound in the game, alerting zombies to your presence if you don't choose your conversations carefully. Games that play with the rules of spoken language are a bit rarer. You're more likely to find this sort of thing in the board game aisle than you are in the video game section, but one specific example does come to mind. Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, a game that's whole gimmick works pretty well in any format but excels in virtual reality, sticks a time bomb in front of you and whoever you're playing with has a real printed manual, or a PDF on their phone or something. Your goal is to reliably translate what you're dealing with to them, while their goal is to flip through the manual and provide you with instructions on how to disarm the bomb. This becomes significantly more complicated when you have to deal with symbols, as they may look different to different people. That's the point. In the realm of body language, we can look back to the Souls games once again, where the language of the multiplayer scene is spoken primarily through gestures. Journey is a wonderful example of this, a linear exploration experience with seamless multiplayer. Throughout the titular journey, you'll encounter beings that look just like you, but your only form of communication will be chirps and gestures. This creates really charming scenarios, where you'll meet another traveler, make friends with them, and then go about your separate ways later on. Your own journeys to be fulfilled. But all of these examples share one common thread, and that's that they're multiplayer. Sure, you can play these games by yourself, well, most of them, but you likely won't experience what I've talked about so far if you do. Suppose then, that instead of the developers toying with how we communicate with each other, they changed how you communicate with the game, how you understand its rules and their intentions. This isn't a new idea, it's been done since the days of tabletop gaming. Early roguelikes that aimed to replicate the same feeling had unidentified potions you may drink in a pinch, only to find yourself set on fire. Scrolls to stockpile and cast out of desperation, only to find that the spell was useless. Information was similarly withheld in old text adventure games, like Zork. It isn't so much that you can't do something, but that the game never has any reason to convey to you that you can. Instead, you're meant to compile what little information you can find in your head or in a notebook and come back to it. The door's locked, huh? I guess I better look for a key. But perhaps another solution is the axe leaning against the tree. Tunic takes this a step further, though. Everything in Tunic is obfuscated. The dialogue, the inventory screen, the pause menu. But most important of all, the in-game manual. Our only glimpse at what the game expects of us beyond exploration. The interesting thing is, though, that I never really had a problem understanding what Tunic expected of me. For all intents and purposes, the entire first half of the game plays like a rather linear Legend of Zelda tribute, just with some added vagueness. When you're playing a game, 
your ability to progress is typically tied to some mechanical or mental skill. This skill gating could be solving puzzles, pressing a sequence of buttons quickly enough, or analyzing an opponent's actions and responding appropriately. There are plenty of ways a game can gate your progress, but the primary way in which Tunic does this is through knowledge gating, that is, leaving you intentionally uninformed of how to play the game. There are many times throughout the opening hours that information will be revealed to you, either a mechanic or a secret route through the world, that has been accessible to you all along. You simply had no idea. This makes subsequent playthroughs very interesting, as you're starting out fresh with information that you previously had to work to obtain. This doesn't mean that the game is a grueling experience, throwing yourself at the same puzzles over and over only to realize that the solution was some hidden mechanic. No, Tunic is signposted exceptionally well. There was never a moment where I felt deceived by the developers, where I felt cheated by the game. There was never a moment of frustration where I said, well that was a waste of my time, they didn't make that remotely clear. Instead, it was consistently awe and wonder, as I felt built up by the knowledge the game gave me. Discovering a new path through the area I was exploring was always a reward, never a punishment. I also almost always had a strong sense of the area I should be exploring, even as I neared the end of the game and the puzzles demanded more of my abilities. I suppose it's time we talk about the second half of the game then, isn't it? That's going to necessitate a spoiler warning. This is knowledge you can't unlearn that will dramatically affect your enjoyment of the game. So here's your warning. Alright, so at the... Well, we'll call it the halfway mark of the game, after you've challenged the final boss and lost, you're thrust into an alternate form of the game's world. You receive a few more pages of the in-game manual and learn about the main hidden mechanic, the Holy Cross. This is a pattern, a spell you cast, that changes depending on where you cast it and what you aim to achieve. This section reminded me most of The Witness, with the puzzles growing increasingly oriented around the environment. But despite this, I still felt like I was in tune with what the developer expected of me. Even when the solution was increasingly vague, I encountered a brick wall and thought, surely they can't expect me to trace the moss on this wall. I'm seeing things. Is this really what they want? And sure enough, there was a hidden chest here. Later on, I focused on solving the mystery of this music note when I realized that if I turned down the background audio, the jingling of this wind chime was far more distinct. I won't spoil exactly how, but discovering that the chimes correspond to this compass blew my mind. This puzzle was such a leap in terms of parsing the information in the manual and yet it still felt manageable with the tools I'd been given. Which means now it's probably time to talk about the in-game manual, and more importantly, the language itself. You're teased with this language all throughout the game, but it's important to note that understanding the language isn't necessary for beating the game, or even getting the good ending, though it is mandatory for the game's hardest puzzles. I'll go ahead and give you another serious spoiler warning here, as this is also information you can't unlearn, and learning to read this language was the best part of the game for me. So, are we good? Okay, so here's the page of the manual explaining how the language works, and the first thing that may stick out to you, which stuck out to me, is that there's way more than 26 letters here. We have two example words, but we aren't exactly told what they are. Is this hero? Knife? I'll tell you right now, it's fox and sword. I was pretty confident with sword, but I did go back and forth a while on fox. Here's the thing, this language is based on phonemes. It's a phonetic language. When you see a glyph or a letter, it makes a specific sound comparable to an English letter, or a combination of English letters. That means that in order to know what a word says, you have to sound it out. Let me give you an example. This is the word for continues. The glyphs here are k, a, n, t, n, u, s. Seems simple enough, right? Well, yeah, in this context, it is. But suppose you don't know any of the glyphs yet, or you only know a few. 
I've come up with a pretty simple way to illustrate this, though I will warn you, I'm not a pro with this language, so it might not be perfect. Here's the phrase, thanks a lot. I think this is a good choice because it highlights several unique principles of the text. Let's start with the different phonemes here and sound it out. Th, A, N, K, S, A, U, A, T. Now let's separate out the vowels from the consonants. Now that that's done, the first thing you may notice is that the T in thanks is significantly different from the T in lot. And the reason for that is that they're just entirely different glyphs. You see, this is the letter for th, the actual sound th. This, however, is the sound for t. One of the first glyphs I figured out was the letter A, and that's because of the frequency with which it appeared. But this isn't actually the letter for A, it's the letter for the sound, a, uh, which is why it doesn't appear over here in the word thanks. That's a different letter. That's A. Thanks a uh, lot. One of the words that confused me for so long was the word the. Much like a, I knew that this word was the because of the frequency with which it appeared. It was just far too common to be any other word, even compared to similar words like an or at. What confused me was how the word is composed. Even after discovering the letter for the t sound, I couldn't make sense of it. Then it clicked. You see the is a two-letter word here. It's the letter th and the letter a which is the same letter we've been using all along for the A sound, the. Another interesting way that this interacts with the text is through the minimization of letter usage. Take for example the word roll. While in English we'd use two L's, in the language of tunic that's redundant. The glyph for L already makes the L sound, so there only needs to be one, roll. Now, I'm not going to run through any more than that. I just wanted to give you a strong basis for how the language is constructed. It isn't really any more complicated than that. But when you have a book full of words you don't know and no way to tell what's what, this is a very daunting task. Here are a couple of words I started with, just in case you're really stumped. Controls. Gun. Golden. There are still plenty of puzzles left for me to solve, even after I've translated the manual. Some of them really have me stumped, but not frustrated, and I think that's an important distinction. I truly believe this game deserves to be held up among the likes of other revolutionary giants like Portal and Myst. In the current gaming climate, the bulk of popular titles still light up exactly where you should be going or float large icons over the heads of characters you need to talk to. Even Doom Eternal had tutorials popping up excessively through the opening sections. Look, I love Doom Eternal. It's a fantastic game. But I feel like there was a better way to communicate this information, too. At what point does how a game chooses to explain itself to the player actively harm the experience? Communication is hard, and people communicate in different ways, often several ways at once. When I personally focus on the concepts of thought and communication, it can be really overwhelming. Everyone feels different, like a puzzle, like a dialogue tree you have to learn the right answers for. How do you know that what you're saying is going to properly represent what you're actually feeling? How do you know that the picture in your head is the one that your words or body language will put in theirs? And the sorry truth is that you don't. It's part of being human, but it's important to have perspective too. If I were to talk to you about an apple, it doesn't matter if the one pictured in my mind is red and the one in yours is green. All that matters is that I've communicated the concept of apple to you. The developers of Tunic succeed in showing that you don't need to know the language of the game to play it, to even beat it, that you can learn it intuitively, that the nature of communicating these concepts isn't reliant on one specific medium, but that you can learn this game in different ways and still come to the proper solutions. They've put the image in your head. 
Language is communal, sure, but I also believe it's deeply personal. How we understand others and how we express ourselves back to them. Each relationship has a unique dialect to it. You speak to a stranger differently than you speak to a loved one. I'm curious how Tunic will speak to you. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Hey guys, this was a really tough one to make. Originally it was like 40 minutes long, but I thought it was really boring and I changed the whole direction of the video and rewrote the script from scratch. So I hope you liked it this time. If you'd like to see more stuff like this, toss me a like and subscribe, it really helps me out. And I guess I'm supposed to go play Outer Wilds now?